And now to kind of wrap up um, the lecture, I want to talk a little bit about religious rituals and how those work. And so the really big key thing here is the use of magic. And magic being um, a system of supernatural beliefs that's involving the manipulation of supernatural forces. And we do this to intervene in a wide range of human activities or other natural events. Okay, so this is different than like our just like colloquial idea of like magic as in street magic or illusion um, or intentional illusion. Okay, and so people who believe in magic and these forces don't see them as an illusion or a placeholder or a symbol. These are very real and very consequential. So there are real consequences um, to engaging in magic or behaving in a magical way or using magic in some way. Okay. And so as anthropologists, our personal belief in magic is irrelevant. It doesn't matter. And so what we're trying to do is understand um, magic and the role of magic in our community's life or in the individual's lives um, who are using that magic. So whether we believe it works, whether we think it works, it's not important. And we're not seeking to prove or disprove whether um, the magic actually had such and such outcome. Really what we're trying to do is understand from that emic or insider perspective um, the role that it plays in the lives of the people of that community. Okay. And so we tend to think about magic being non-Western and um, that Western people don't engage in magic. But I'm going to have an article up for you um, about baseball magic and the use of magic in baseball. And it's a really, really interesting article and a classic anthropological article. And so I want you to read that for this week. And um, I'll post a link in the description on YouTube as well. So if you're watching there, you can just link straight to it. But read that article and then think about how we do engage in magic in our culture, even if we don't really think about it in that way, right? Okay. So then there's going to be two types of magic, and your book does a good job about describing these, but I wanted to go ahead and do it um, myself here as well. So you have imitative magic, and this is any kind of magic performed that mimics the desired result. So your book gives the perfect example of a voodoo doll, or something similar where you're doing what you would like to have happen in the real world on that doll so poking it with a needle for instance and um, then that would have the same mirrored effect on the actual individual then there is contagious magic magic and so this is saying that objects that are in close contact with the person and the book uses an example of a lock of hair and so that object continues to influence the person even after it's separated from the person so this is where you'll see um, ritual where you have to have an object that the person has touched or part of their person, and um, then you can complete the ritual. Okay, so two different types of magic there. Okay, and then we want to talk about very briefly just ritual symbols. And so these five um, symbols are common throughout religion and um, are used cross-culturally. So you have objects, colors, actions, events, and words. Um, in parentheses, you just have examples of each, but all five of these are kind of shown throughout world religions, um, not just those big five, but then um, most all other religions as well. So these are pretty universal. Um, so you have objects that serve as symbols, so in Christianity, wafer and wine. Um, you have colors, and colors, um, we use cross-culturally a lot, um, so I think there, there are three, and white is one of them, so white is indicating purity or grief, depending on the context, right? And so then we have actions, events, and words, which um, all serve kind of similar purposes, and we use these same symbols across religions um, found throughout the world. 